says he'll deliver you out of them all. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Tell everybody how he saved you. This is the gospel. Come in the good news. Tell everybody there's a God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. There's a God that loves you. Oh, how he loves you. There's a God that loves you. Father, we thank you and we give you praise and glory and honor for the time that you've given to us tonight to study your word collectively as a church family. We're asking tonight that you would lead us and that you would guide us in your word, causing us to grow and causing us to become the people of God that you have destined for us to become. Thank you for this great church and for the opportunity that you give to us, God every single week and really every single day to really be transformed by the renewing of our minds as we go into your word. And I pray that you would help us, that you would lead us and guide us tonight as only you can. We'll give you the praise, we'll give you glory, and we will give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Every glad heart said amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord, greater faith. Bible Tabernacle, God bless each and every one of you on tonight. I trust uh, that you've got your Bible, you've got something to write with, and you've got something to write on as we are preparing to study God's Word together tonight. We are adding another installment to the series of lessons that we've been teaching entitled The Resurrected Life. And we've been talking about how the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how it should empower us and indeed impact us so that we are living differently because we have a greater understanding of the resurrection. For those of you that are joining us for the very first time or maybe the second time, or maybe you're just not a member, you are a regular attendee, of Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle. We thank God for each and every one of you. If you were here in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning, our hospitality team would do all that they would and could to put into your hands a very special and free gift uh, that we believe will enhance your walk with the Lord. And it is also a way to commemorate your time here uh, in the house of God. But because we're all virtual tonight, and as we are every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is our time for midweek Bible study, midweek impact. Because we're all virtual, I'm just going to ask you to do one thing for us. If you don't mind, put guest in, maybe two things. Put guest in the chat area. Put guest in the chat area. Or if you don't want to do that, because I know because of my travel uh, that God allows me to be able to do as God opens doors around the country and outside of the country. I meet people who watch our Bible studies and um, you don't put anything in the chat area. You don't make any comments, but you let me know that you are watching. Well, here's another way that you can help us. We have released our faith uh, to have 500 visitors to Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle between the month of March and September of this year. And we're not just counting those who physically are able to come to the house of God. We're counting even those who meet us in the virtual space. And so if you don't want to put guests in the chat area, you don't want you know to put anything in the, in the comment section or the chat area, we understand that. But I am going to ask you to sign our digital guest book, if you don't mind. All you have to do is scan the code there and uh, let us know that you are here. And it's our way of being able to know that we're moving in the right direction as we again have released our faith for 500 guests from March of this year until September of this year.
And so we're asking, if you don't mind, sign our digital guest book. All you have to do is scan the code that's there. There'll be a prompt that'll pop up on your phone or on your smart screen. and You'll be able uh, to do that. If um, by chance you are using your smart device, you can do a screenshot and you can go back later and fill in that information. It only takes about 20 seconds or so and you can do that. Well, if you live in Western New York, we would love for you to be our guest here at Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle and let us know uh, that you would like to come and be a part of our worship experience. And one of the ways you can do that is you can um, just let us know uh, that you would like to come by scanning that particular code that's there or you can call our church office with the information that you see there on the screen. Let us know what Sunday you will come and we will have something that we can put in your hand and we will be able to better prepare uh, for your time here in the house of God. Well, let's get into uh, the word of the Lord uh, tonight. In Romans chapter number eight, it is our theme verse of scripture for this entire series entitled The Resurrected Life, The Resurrected Life. And so what we have discovered from Romans chapter number eight and verse number 11, Paul says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and that's the key phrase, if that spirit dwells in you, then that spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead is going to do something for you because he dwells in you. And so this has been our theme scripture for this particular series as we are uh, really getting a better understanding of what it means to live a resurrected life. I shared this on Sunday that I really believe that this is the crux. In addition to understanding that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, that this is the crux of the resurrected life, that being empowered by the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to operate beyond human training beyond human education and beyond human experience. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he takes us beyond human training, human experience, and human education. I just remembered I need to grab something. Um, so you're going to hear my chair squeak just a little bit. Maybe. Okay. Maybe not. But make sure you write this down, screenshot it, but make sure you write that down because when it comes to understanding what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, it literally means that God has now given us the ability, catch this, he's given us the ability to go beyond human, catch this, to go beyond human training, human education, and indeed human experience. We're going beyond. The Holy Spirit allows us to go beyond. This past Sunday, we gave you the example of uh, Bazaliel. The Bible says God filled him with the Spirit of God which gave him the ability, I'll put this on the screen, let me do a quick review from Sunday. Bazalia was given um, through the Holy Spirit, or through the Spirit of God, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and a skill set to help build the tabernacle. Then we find in scripture that Samson is empowered by the Spirit of God. And he began to have supernatural abilities beyond his human, um, his human experience, if I can say it that way. David, when he is anointed for the very first time, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. Why? Because God desired 
David to be king over his people. And in doing that, he says, I'm going to help you by giving you of my spirit. Let's go a step further. In Acts chapter number two, the apostles are recorded as doing many wonders and signs because of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul the apostle continues that by saying that God used him to do mighty signs and wonders uh, by the power, again, of the Spirit of God. And we said this on Sunday, this enablement, this power, this gift has been given to you and I. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. Uh, we, we certainly can't steal it. We can't order it. It is a gift and it has been given to us. Now, one of the things that we've got to be able to do is we've got to be able to unearth, if I can say it that way, We've got to be able to unearth. We've got to be able to stir up. We've got to be able to activate what God has already given to us. We've got to be able to activate what God has already given to us. I want to say that again. We've got to be able to activate using our faith what God has already given to you and has given to me. And so Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number one in verse six and seven, wherefore I put thee in remembrance. That's what this series is for, for some of us. I'm By the Holy Spirit, I'm trying to remind us, put myself in there. I'm trying to remind us by the Holy Spirit and through his word that we have been given this gift from God. But we've got to stir up that gift Paul says to Timothy, this gift was given to you because I laid hands on you. And this gift, this passage of the scripture speaks of a, um, if I can say it this way, a transferring of an anointing, a transferring of an anointing in the life of his son in ministry, Timothy. He says, I need you to stir up. I need you to activate what I put in you when I laid hands along with the other elders, that's what the presbytery is for, or uh, meant by the, the, the presbytery, when they laid on those hands. Now watch this. He says, stir up the gift that, that is in you by the putting on of my hands. But catch this. For God, catch this, please. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I want to say that again. God didn't give us the spirit of fear. He did give us the spirit, but he didn't give us the spirit of fear. He gave us the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. And I want, for those of you that are taking notes, I want you to consider something here that I believe that God showed me in studying this passage of scripture some, some time ago. If you look at verse number seven, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Many of us, we know this. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. If you look at fear, he says God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but he did give us power, love, and a sound mind. Can I suggest to you that fear will affect the other three things that are mentioned in the remaining of this verse, I'll put it up on the screen. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us power, love, and a sound mind. When you and I operate in fear, we won't use the power that God gives to us. When we operate in fear, we won't love the way God intends for us to love. When we operate in fear, we won't operate with the soundness of the mind that God has given to us. I want to say that again. When you and I operate in fear, we do not operate and use the power that we actually have. When we operate in fear, we don't love the way we should love. There are some people who won't get into certain relationships because you've been hurt in the past. And you are afraid of hurting that way in a relationship ever again. And so it's, it's difficult and challenging for you to love at that level 
because you are still operating in fear. And the Bible says God didn't give us that, that spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When you and I are operating in fear, there are certain things that you just don't do using the soundness of mind. There are some of us uh, who are afraid of animals or afraid of um, insects. And you, you've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. Um, uh, for those of you who feel like you're so powerful in the Holy Spirit and all those kinds of things, then I'm, I'm going to need you. <laughs> I'm going to need you to be able to kill your own insects in your own house and not run crazy. Um, when you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you, you want to come here and rebuke demons and devils, but you're running from ants and spiders. You're not going to talk in here. You know, you, you want to, you know, cast out, you know, demons and pray people through to the Holy Spirit, but you can't kill an insect. Come on now. God has not given us the spirit of fear, of the power, of love, and the sound mind. Now, I say that tongue in cheek, but seriously, I say that tongue in cheek. I'm, I'm just using that example. But the part, uh, the point I really want to stress is that when you and I are operating in fear, there are certain things that we don't do or don't even think correctly because we're operating in fear. There are some of us who have gone through all kinds of things in our lives. And fear tells us that um, if everybody knows what you've gone through, they may treat you differently. Well, because of that fear, when that begins to set in your heart and in your mind, you may begin thinking in crowded rooms or sanctuaries, everybody knows. Everybody doesn't even talk to you. But when I'm operating in fear, I'm not using the soundness of the mind that God has given to me. That's just an example. It's just, just, just an example. And, and so I really want us to understand that when I'm operating in fear, it affects my power. It affects how I love. It affects how I think. When I'm operating in fear, it affects my ability, my ability to love, and the way that I think. And so I got to understand, I'm not, I'm not called to operate in fear. The resurrected life is not a life of fear. It is a life of faith. Let's take it a step further. In Ephesians chapter number three, verse number 20, recently in our Fresh Start Morning Devotion, we've been talking uh, about, uh, we talked rather about Ephesians chapter number three, verse number 20. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it tonight, but I do want to stress something again. It's just now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Catch this, according to the power that works in us. And because I spent several days on that, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I do want to stress the fact that God is able to do all of the things that the Bible says he can do in this verse of scripture. But he says, according to the power that we allow to work in us. So it's not enough just to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit if we're not going to allow him to work in our lives. Let me show you another passage of scripture. And I really want this to sink in. This is another one of these verses. Let me just say this. Let me pause and say this. There are a lot of Bible verses um, that many of us, because we've been exposed to scripture for so long, that we're able to rattle off and quote, you know, um, one, one of my Achilles heel in ministry is I can quote more than I can locate in scripture. In other words, there are people um, that if I share their names, you would know them, but they're able to say, and the Bible says in, in Revelation chapter number three and verse number, you know, the 26, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the Bible says in Hebrews uh, six and one, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on, so And the Bible says in Titus uh, chapter number two, verse two, and da, 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 I can't do that uh, like I want to do it. Um, I, I'm not able to recall those details, but I can recall things that are in scripture. 
um, and, and be able to use them as proof texts. I bring that up because when it comes to, you know, what we're able to quote, it means absolutely nothing. And we don't get the benefit of what we quote if we don't believe what we quote. I want to say that again. Maybe someone will help me teach tonight and put it in the chat area. I don't get the benefit of what I quote if I don't believe what I quote. Because I can quote all kinds of scriptures, but if I am not believing those scriptures, if I'm not, hear me very carefully, if I am not, uh, how can I say this? Um, if I can quote, God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If I can quote that, but if I don't believe it, I'll never get saved. Or I may believe that other people can get, can be saved, but I'm too, you know, I, I, I've gone through, I've dealt with so much that he won't save someone like me. Now, I can quote John 3.16, but if I don't believe John 3.16, I can't get the benefit of John 3.16. I hope this is making sense because it, it can become a, a trap to be able to quote Bible verses but not be able to believe Bible verses. I, I, I'm, I'm recalling a, a scripture um, that talks about um, that we should not just be hearers of the word of God, but we have to be doers of the word of God. And we do the word of God because we believe the word of God. All right. See, I just gave another verse of scripture right now on the top of my head. I couldn't tell you exactly where it's found. I do know it's in the Bible. <laughs> but, but, but again, that that's you know something that I'm uh, trying to work on. Now, the point I'm making and stressing is, is this: I'm going to put up on the screen a Bible verse that many of you, once you see it, will probably be able to quote. For some of you, I could pro if there were a way that I could cover the the verse and only show you the book and the chapter and the verse number, you could probably rattle it off, you know, and be able to uh, to say. Uh, what that verse says. As, as a matter of fact, let, let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. I'm going to uh, I'm going to put up a picture. I'm going to put up our theme for this year, still intentional. All right. And I'm going to give the book, the chapter, and the verse number. And I am going to begin this verse. And I want you to put the verse of scripture in the chat. All right. It's going to be an exercise. All right. So let me do this again. I'm going to say what the verse is, the book, the chapter and the verse number. And then I'm going to read a portion of that verse. I want you to put the rest of that verse or all of those. It's relatively short. I want you to put the verse of scripture in the chat. All right. It's going to be our exercise for tonight. Philippians chapter number four and verse 13 says these words. I can do all. Finish that. I'll wait a few moments while you write the remainder or all of that verse in. As a matter of fact, let me chat. Put all the put all of that verse in the chat area. Put all of that verse there. Many of us, we know it. It's not a trick. Many of us, we know it. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all. Finish that. Put it in the chat area. Everyone that's watching that knows this verse, go ahead and put it in the chat area. Even those of you that don't normally put things in the chat area, I'm talking to you as well because I know some of you, and I'm not talking to those that are not members of our church. I'm talking to those who are members of our church. I want to see you put that verse of scripture there in the chat as well. If you're watching with us uh, on Wednesday night, put it there. Don't log out. Don't act like you didn't hear me. Put it in the chat. Come on. Philippians 4.13 says, and it's easy by now because some of you have already put it in, in the verse there. Let me put it up on the screen. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth 
me. Now, many of you were able to put that entire verse in the chat before I even showed it to you on the screen. Why? Because we have been exposed to that verse. We have read that verse. We have quoted that verse. We have heard sermons or Bible studies mention this particular verse of scripture. And we know what it says. We know what it says, but I'm going to put it up on the screen anyway. I want you to look at the verse, the first two words, the first three words. I can do. I can do. Now, I know, I know for some of you, your mindset is, all right, you know, I know what the Bible says. Uh, I can do that, that, that for many of us, again, we know this verse, but here's where God is challenging us tonight. Do we actually believe this verse? I didn't intend to spend this much time on this particular uh, verse of scripture. As a matter of fact, I want to make sure that I'm able to end where I need to end. But I'm going to put it up on the screen again. I want to put it up on the screen. I can do. I know we can quote it. I know many of you put it in the chat because you can recite it. But here's the thing. Do we really, truly believe it? If I were to say it, uh, like my, my, my spiritual daughter, she used to... Uh, Say, really? <laughs> She's probably watching um, tonight. You know, really? Do you really? Because I'm asking, God's asking us, do we really believe this verse of scripture? Do we? Do we actually believe that we can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me? And I don't, I, I wouldn't. I'm not going to say that God has given me some deep revelation uh, on this particular passage of scripture. I'm not, I'm not going to say that tonight. But I will say that I do believe that God has given me a way to understand this passage of scripture better. Because here's the thing. For those of us who actually believe this verse of scripture, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth, strengtheneth me. I can do it. I know it. I can quote it. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. A lot of us who even can quote it, and for some of us who actually believe it, here's where the disconnect of our faith comes in. And please stay with me tonight. Here's where the disconnect of our faith comes in. Because we believe that we need to feel the strength before we know we have the strength. Stay with me. Yeah, I, I believe that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And, and some of us are waiting to either be told something or in many cases to feel something so we know that we can do something. You know. Um, we have to be, and I am 100% guilty of this, we have to be careful with our church lingo. Now, I feel like praising. I feel like preaching. I feel like praying. Ever that's one of those things I got to do <laughs> and should do whether I feel like doing it or not. And so a lot of times we are waiting on God to do something so that we feel stronger so that we know he has strengthened us to do it. Stay with me. I can do, use my cup here, all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now, how do I know is the relevant question. How do I know that he has 
strengthened me. How do I know? You know, I, I believe that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, but how do I know he's strengthened me to do this? Ooh, hope this is making sense. How do I know that he has strengthened me to do this? Because in many cases, we disconnect our faith until we're able to answer that relevant question. And that is, how do I know I have the strength before I do it? Because that's really what we're asking. Before I do this, I need to know that I have the strength. Now, I believe that God, uh, that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But how do I know he has strengthened me to do this? Now, here, here's a couple of things I want, I want you to take note of tonight. And I hope this is making sense as we slow down the text of script, Scripture for just a moment. I pray this is making sense. One, you will not know. Well, let me, let, let me say it this way. Here's number one. In understanding this, here's number one. Christ will not strengthen you to do all things. Wait a minute, Bishop. Wait a minute. You, you just said, I can do all things. Paul said to the Philippian church, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That is true. That is absolutely true. But here's the thing. Christ will not strengthen you to do all things. That's the first thing you have to understand. That just because the verse says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He is not saying that Christ is going to strengthen you to do all things. God has not strengthened me, catch this, to be a concert pianist. He's not strengthened me to do that. Christ has not strengthened me to be the president of the United States of America. He's not strengthened me to be an astronaut. He's not strengthened me to build a skyscraper. He has not strengthened me to be a surgeon and to be board certified as a surgeon. He has not strengthened me to be a politician. He's not strengthened me. And so the text is not saying I can do everything because he's going to strengthen me. No, 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 no. So the first thing we have to understand is Christ is not going to strengthen you and I to do everything. He will strengthen you and I to do some things. And the things that he strengthens you to do, you can do all of those. Oh, <laughs> let, me, let me make sure I'm, I'm making sense. Christ is not going to strengthen me to do everything. He's only going to strengthen me to do some things. But of the things that he strengthens me to do, I can do all of those. Let me give you a third time. Let me give it to you a third time. Christ is not going to strengthen me to do all things, but the things that he strengthens me to do, oh, I can do all of those. That's how we have to understand that, that, that passage of scripture. That's number one. Christ is not going to strengthen you to do everything. So there are some things that you may want to do, have a desire to do, that Christ didn't strengthen you to do. And so don't use this verse of scripture to declare, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Though that is true, you have to know whether or not Christ has strengthened you to do it. Here's number two. Here's number two. Some of you may not have known that that was all of this was in, in that passage of scripture. Here's the second thing you have to understand. We have to understand about this particular passage of scripture so that we can understand it effectively. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. How do you know you have the strength that Christ has given you? The only way that we know that we have that strength is when we attempt to do some of these things. I can do all things. I'm, I'm going to have to attempt one of all of those things to know I have been strengthened by Christ to do it. You don't know you've been strengthened to do it unless you attempt to do it. Give me very carefully. Stay with me. Because someone is asking, well, what if I tried to do it and I fail? Does that mean that Christ has not strengthened me to do it? Not necessarily. 
Maybe you're trying to do something that Christ told you to do and has strengthened you to do it, but you, you're trying to do it the wrong way. You're strengthened to do it, but you're trying to do it the wrong way. On Sunday, hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. On Sunday, if the Lord delays his coming and releases us to do so, on Mother's Day, I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit will give you strategy. If, if you and I go back, let me do this. Let's, let's look at these passages of Scripture. We're going to end in, in uh, 2 Peter, I believe, tonight. I hope this is making sense. Because we're talking about the resurrected life. So how do I know that I have this ability? Well, one, I have to know he's not strengthening me to do everything. Here in this particular passage of Scripture, notice that God gave Bezaliel wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and skill set to do what he asked him to do. So not only did he give him the power, <clears throat> he, gives, he gives him strategy to get it done. Same thing with Samson. He didn't just empower him. He gave him strategy to get things done. As a matter of fact, the Bible says with Samson, when he decides to marry uh, his, uh, when he decides to get married, he finds a Philistine woman down in Timnath. And the Bible says he tells his parents, go arrange that marriage for me. This is back when uh, in the Bible times when they were arranging marriages and um, some still do it today. Um, but he, he says, go get her for me. And the parents were saying, out of all the people that you could pick, why would you pick our, someone who is an arch enemy of ours? Because at this time, Israel and the Philistines didn't get along you know, so well. And um, as a matter of fact, the Philistines were now oppressing um, the Hebrews. And so they were like, well, why can't you pick one of our people? And the Bible says that they didn't know that Samson was using this as an opportunity to begin to operate in his assignment in beginning to deliver Israel from the hands of the enemy or from the hands of the Philistines. I hope this is making sense. He didn't just give him muscle. He didn't just give him supernatural strength. He actually gave him strategy. I hope this is making sense. Um, here's another one. David, he's given wisdom to be king. The apostles were given power to work signs and wonders. My God, today. Y'all remember when um, it was offering time in the early church and, and everybody was, you know, literally, they, I, I'm going to use this as an example. Everybody, everybody that's watching, put the word example. Example. Put it in the chat area. Real quick, real quick. Put it in the chat area. Real quick, real quick, real quick. Put it in the chat area. Example, example, example. This is an example, um, and I'm I'm wanting you to to do that so that you know people don't take it you know you know the wrong way and, and be offended and think that I'm talking about them when I'm really not, because um, I, I I don't know. Um, everyone in the early church decided to give a certain way. Everyone who had something decided to sell something and then give the money to the church so that the church could do ministry. Um, like a capital campaign. They weren't building anything, but they wanted the resources to be able to do ministry. And um, when Ananias and Sapphira came to give their offering, out of all the people, that are giving in the offering. Peter stops and asks, you know, the husband first, or the wife first, or the husband, I can't remember which, which came in first, whether the husband or the wife. Um, maybe it's the wife that came first. I don't know. I can't remember. Somebody put it in there in the chat area. See? Certain things I can remember, some things I can't. But it's in the book of Acts. You'll find it there. Um, but he asks one spouse, did you sell the land for so much money? And the person lied and said, yeah, we sold it, you know, for so much money. Strategy comes in when God allows 
Peter to ask that question. We say, well, Bishop, you know, how can you say that, that, that God gave, you know, told Peter to ask that question? Because when the spouse gives the answer, the Bible says that Peter knew it was incorrect. And Peter's response was, why did you choose to lie to the Holy Spirit? So again, these signs and wonders were not just empowerment. There was strategy to go along with that. You know, what does that have to do with strategy? God was trying by the use of the apostles to set a certain precedent and order and decorum in this early church about integrity and accountability. All right. So somebody's probably put that in, in the chat area. Uh, let me move on real quick. Again, Paul, the apostle strategy. He didn't just have wisdom strategy. God gave him strategy. Now, let me do this so I can flip through this. Now, Everyone that you saw from Bezaliel to David to Samson to the apostles to Paul, and there are others, every last one of them only knew that they could do it. Thank you, Lord. This is another example just dropped in my, in my spirit. And we'll probably try to find that real quick. They didn't know that they could do it until they tried. Bezalia didn't know that he could build the tabernacle until he built the tabernacle. Samson didn't know that he had the strength that he had until God gave him the strength that he had, but he had to try something. God, I thank you. Solomon is called to be king after David. Solomon is David's son. And the Bible says that after Solomon is anointed to be king. God visits Solomon and says, Solomon, what can I do for you? And Solomon says, I want wisdom so that I can be a good king. And God says to Solomon, because you didn't ask for, you know, a lot of money. You didn't ask for the life of your enemies. He says, um, uh, I, I'm going to throw those things in as well. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make you rich and, and I'm going to give you some peace and from your enemies and all those kinds of things. Um, but, but he says concerning that wisdom, he says, I will also do that thing that you have asked. Now, when the Lord says to Solomon, I'm going to do that thing that you asked about that wisdom thing. How did Solomon know he had the, the, the divine wisdom until he is first presented with um, a, a scenario where he has to rely, let me check my time, he has to rely on the wisdom of God. In other words, you don't know you've been strengthened to do something until you attempt to do it. How do I know that I have the ability to lift this water bottle or this container? How do I know? I want what's in it. I just messed up my example. I just lifted it up. <laughs> How do I know I can lift it without trying? I have to put forth some effort to try it. Now, for those of us who are of a certain age, some of us, we went to reach for a cup. It may have slipped out of our hands. It may have broken, uh, spilled the contents on the table, on the ground or what have you, that doesn't mean that you're, you're not empowered to hold a cup. It just means that you were trying to do it the wrong way. You didn't grab it the right way. Oh, I wish this is, I hope this is making sense. It's not that God didn't anoint you to do it. You're just trying to do it the wrong way. So just because there's a struggle in doing it, doesn't mean that you're not empowered to do it. Nehemiah is called of God to build the wall. We'll talk about this on Sunday. The Lord say the same. God gave him a strategy, but even though God gave him a strategy as he begins to view the wall at night, doesn't mean that he doesn't have enemies to try to make it difficult. He's got Sanballat, Tobiah, and Jeshem who act as antagonists in that story. I hope this is making sense. So just because there's a struggle doesn't mean that God didn't anoint you to do it. But this is also why we've got to know the voice of God for ourselves so that in the midst of struggle, we can go back to God and say, God, you know, what's going on? Give me wisdom. Just like Rebecca, when she was 
um, blessed to finally get pregnant after being considered to be barren. And when she finally gets pregnant, all of a sudden her children are, are fighting on the inside because there's no ultrasound. There's no x-ray. She has no idea what's going on. So she goes to God and says, God, if it be so, why am I thus? That's King James language for what's going on. <laughs> Woo! That's why sometimes just because it's a struggle, it doesn't mean that you're blessed, that you're not blessed. Just because it, it might be difficult to do doesn't mean that you have not been graced to do it. The Bible says of Jesus, hallelujah to the lamb. The Bible says of Jesus that God has anointed him, uh, uh, anointed him with power and with the Holy Ghost. And he went uh, throughout uh, the region doing good. And yet. His ultimate assignment was to die for our sins and going through what we call the passion, the prayer in the garden. Great uh, sweat, like great, uh, great drops of blood fell from his face and fell from his body. And if you study that out, oh God, I'm probably going to mess this up. Hemotidrosis. I think that's the term. It's when you're under so much stress that your sweat glands. And your, um, your, your sweat glands and blood vessels under that amount of stress uh, break down to the point to where blood now enters into the stream of where your sweat glands are. And you literally begin to bleed sweat. Another uh, phrase that is used for that phenomenon is bloody sweat. So you've got sweat and blood coming out of the pores uh, on your skin. So it doesn't mean that he wasn't anointed to do it. We know he was anointed to do it, but it doesn't mean that it was not difficult to get it done. We taught a series prior to the pandemic, difficult but doable. Some of you may remember that, okay? So again, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So what does that have to do with the resurrected life? Again, having the power of the Holy Spirit moves me beyond human training, human education, human experience. I have the ability to have access to resurrection power. With that resurrection power, I have the ability to live in the newness of life. Remember that phrase newness of life literally means uncommon, unprecedented, and unheard of. That's the kind of life God has called us to live. But I have to believe the word of God so that I can live that kind of life. Hopefully this passage of scripture will help us to do that in 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 4. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse, and verse number 4. I, I want you to write that down, but I, I want to read a little bit more of this uh, passage of scripture. I want to read um, a little bit more of this uh, if I can. Go in your Bibles if you have it. Go to First Peter or Second Peter chapter number one and verse number one. I'll put that back on the screen in just a moment. We're doing good on time. Thank you for hanging in with us. Second Peter chapter number one, verse number one, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is his uh, greeting. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He continues, verse number three, according as his divine power hath given unto us, catch this, talk about strategy. This divine power has given to us all things that pertaineth to life and godliness. I, I hope you have your Bible. This is Second Peter chapter number one and verse number three. He says, this divine power that we have been given, he also refers to this as, um, um, as a pr like precious faith. All right. So he's talking to other spirit filled believers. And Peter says these words, according as his, that is God's divine power hath given unto us all things 
that pertain unto life and godliness. Catch this, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue. In other words, he's given us all things that we need that pertain to life and godliness. This is one of, God, I thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is one of the reasons why I preach a powerful gospel. Not because I'm a powerful preacher, but I preach a powerful gospel, not a weak gospel, not a gospel of, of barely making it, because I don't see that in Scripture. And there's some things that I'm trying to progress even in my own life. God, I thank you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. There are some things that I'm trying to progress in. But he tells us, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Think about that for just a moment. This divine power helps me in my regular life and in my godly walk with the Lord. In other words, this divine power will help me with human things and divine or spiritual things. We'll talk about this on Sunday, but, but, but I, I really want us to see this. And maybe we'll read this again on, on, on Sunday. Verse number three, according to his divine power, have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us unto glory and virtue. In other words, it is through my knowledge of God. It is through my knowledge of his will, his word. It is, it is my understanding of who he is that has an effect on me and how I believe. We, we deal with it on Sunday. The Lord say the same. Whereby we, watch this, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these might that by these might, ye might rather, be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let me read this again. Whereby this divine nature, this divine power, by that we have been given exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers, catch this, of the divine nature having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of his divine nature. We are sharers of this divine nature. God has allowed us to partake, take part in this divine nature that goes beyond my human training, beyond my human experience, beyond my human education. There was nothing wrong with my training. There was nothing wrong or sinful about my experience. There was nothing wrong or sinful, generally speaking, about my education. Nothing wrong, nothing sinful about being educated or being trained or having experience in a particular area. There was nothing sinful about that. But the power of the Holy Spirit moves me beyond those boundaries so I can live this unprecedented, unheard of, and uncommon life called the newness of life. I hope this is making sense. God willing, we will add to this as we go into this series even further. But I trust that we will no longer just look at Bible verses, but we will consider whether or not we actually believe the things that we read. And I trust that we will. The Lord say the same. I'll see you tomorrow morning in Fresh Start, or I'll see you on Sunday morning as we go into the sanctuary online in this place. Um, I wish I had, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if It didn't come through. All right. I'll wait. I'll share that at another time. Uh, but we got some new things in the Life Center. Um, thank 
you for your giving and your capital campaign. I need you to continue to do so um, as we are seeking to maintain that which God has given to us. And uh, I trust uh, that you will, you will do that. God bless you. I'll see you soon.